Kingdom Come Deliverance is a really interesting game. It does a lot really well, but still retains much of the janky eccentricities that so many have come to know and love about AA independent studios. Put simply, they set out to create a grounded, realistic, believable medieval RPG, complete with narrative systems, with hardcore combat, and also a world that's designed around one simple premise, and that is that it doesn't treat you any differently than anybody else living in the world. It's a really nice departure from the frustratingly common tropes surrounding fantasy RPGs. So often, when a game hands you a shield and a sword, you would expect to have magic wielded in the other hand. So, to finally get a video game with knights, sword combat, and a captivating story that doesn't rely on magic to fill in the gaps, it's a dream come true for many. Now, I should be clear, I tried to play the game when it launched back on February 13th of 2018, but unfortunately there were too many technical issues to make it playable, at least for me at that time. You see, back then it was pretty poorly optimized. It had many bugs, glitches were very common, and it wasn't unheard of to be forced into a hard reboot every hour of gameplay or so. In other words, it took a lot of patience to get through a run-through of Kingdom Come Deliverance when it first came out. And I, being a very small YouTuber at the time, trying to cover as many titles as I possibly could, simply deemed the game to be too much of a headache to tolerate, at least at that time. Plus, I was in school full-time, and 2018 was a very competitive year when it came to video games. And it's an important point to remember, video games aren't entitled to your attention. You are giving them the money. You are the one paying for the quality experience that is what you expect. If it's not what you expect, you should demand your money back as soon as you realize it's not up to your liking. And in this case, Kingdom Come Deliverance was just so janky that it wasn't really playable for me. And so I simply set the game aside. And I was intent on returning to it at a future date once patches and DLC had ironed out most of the problems. But then a bunch of stuff happened. Death Stranding, COVID, an attempt to overthrow the United States government. I mean, you know, normal, like, American stuff. <laughs> so now here we are in 2022. The game's been out for four years, and it's actually received so much TLC, time, love, and care, that I actually think the game is pretty playable and enjoyable, at least on PC where I played it. So I decided that it was finally time to jump into it. So I hopped over onto our Twitch stream and started going through it with all of you guys that were hanging out in chat. By the way, if you have not joined us for a live stream, you should definitely do that. Links in the description box in the link tree underneath the like button. Chances are I'm actually probably live at the very moment that you are watching this video. I'm live a lot so come by say hi i'd love to see you now once i started playing the game i could immediately see what so many others had been talking about for so long the game is very immersive the writing is compelling the characters are vividly portrayed and the music is delightful but even so, there are a lot of problems that will present themselves almost immediately, even after all of the work that they did on the game after it came out, the most obvious point of which would be the combat. It takes a lot of getting used to, and while it may initially appear like a more simplified version of For Honor's combat system, it's actually a lot more complicated, with plethora combos, abilities, and skills that change how it works. It takes a ton of getting used to, and I think most players won't grow truly comfortable with it until they reach 30 to 50 hours into the game which is significant. I mean, normally we only see that sort of barrier to entry in huge JRPGs that are like 200 hours long just for the main story. So to see a game like this, which you can reasonably expect to last between 90 and 120 hours, to say that you won't get comfortable with the combat for probably a third to a half of its runtime, is pretty significant. Furthermore, the facial animations are pretty rough. Traversal animations are also clunky, and while the game has certain moments that are beautifully realized, playing it nowadays certainly reminds you that this is a double-A venture and not a triple-A blockbuster. You will also immediately notice once you open the menus that there are countless skills to be unlocked and an overwhelming list of character traits. 
and you may even find yourself feeling as though you have no idea what the hell you're doing in the opening hours. I mean, really, if I had to put this whole thing into one word, how I felt when I started playing the game for the first time, I would say daunting is the best way to phrase it. There's just a lot here and the game doesn't lie to you or pretend like it's simpler than it actually is. There are many layers of complexity here, things to consider, everything from the clothes you wear being dirty for a given conversation, to the types of clothes that you're wearing, and even the length of time since you last slept in a comfortable bed, all can have major impacts on a certain conversation that you have. There are so many things to consider, so many rules to the game, as it were, that it can be a little overwhelming to start. But as with most overwhelming things, once you grow to understand its systems, you will probably find yourself very appreciative of them, and even a fan. Now, if I had to concisely describe the opening sections of the game, I would say that Kingdom Come Deliverance is a title that demands a lot of the player. You have to meet it more than halfway for sure, and you must also be willing to tolerate its many eccentricities. Now, some people are more capable of this than others, because some may consider the slow build-up to the game's main act unnecessary, while others may see it as a helpful build-up to prime the player for what they will encounter. Some may really hate the combat and find it incredibly difficult to learn, while others will say that it's supposed to be that way, because Henry, the game's protagonist, is is also learning how to fight and engage enemies, so it only makes sense that he would be struggling with it as well. You can really make excuses for almost every single frustration and critique that I just outlined, and while I think some of them are fair and others are not, the point is that your tolerance for these things is going to be different than mine, and different from everybody else who is watching this video. And that's okay, don't get me wrong, it's okay to have differences of opinion and tolerance for jankiness. It's not a bad thing. In fact, if your tolerance is really high, you're going to end up liking a lot more indie titles and appreciating so many more games that just simply aren't able to deliver on that AAA polished experience that you might expect from something like Rockstar or Naughty Dog or Sony Santa Monica. Regardless, if you heard me describe all of that and the game still sounds interesting, you should definitely go and play it. This video will still be here when you are done with the game. Or if you watch this video as you boot up the game for the first time, that's totally okay. But it's also important to note that I will be spoiling a lot. I'll try to avoid the last like 50 hours or so, like the last third of the game, I'd probably say just for sake of spoilers because I don't think I need to show it to make most of my points. And if I can make my points without showing late game spoilers, I usually try to do that in these videos. But even so, if you are sensitive to spoilers for the first half to two thirds of the game, be warned. I will be showing pretty much everything. On the other hand, if all of this sounds like the game is just asking too much and you really don't think that you are going to enjoy your time with it, follow your gut. Watch the rest of this video and see if it changes your mind at any point, but understand that your initial impression of the title is probably going to follow through with the overall experience that you can expect to have. It really is that simple. If a game doesn't look fun to you, chances are you won't have fun playing it. And if this looks really interesting and looks right up your alley, you'll probably be more willing to forgive a lot of the weird things that they chose to do. But setting all of that aside, in this video I'm going to go through everything that I think the game does really well. And I'm also going to touch on a lot of things that I think the sequel could improve upon. Most immediate suggestions that I think I could go with would be improvements to the game engine and animation systems. It would help greatly with the game's presentation and longevity, and I also think that it would generally improve the quality of most people's experiences, especially in the opening hours. But listen, I know it's a lot easier said than done to just be like, fix your game, it's broken! Just put in an Unreal Engine, let Epic deal with it. Like, I know that that's really cringe and stupid, and that's not necessarily what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the Crytek engine, which is what they used for Kingdom Come Deliverance, and what they've already announced they will continue to use with the sequel, it's just 
janky and just it's not very good anymore especially compared to some of the engines other major studios are using it just doesn't really hold up and like i said they've already confirmed that they're sticking with this engine for the time being and they have no plans of changing engines at least before they release whatever their next game is going to be, which we can only assume is going to be a sequel to this one. So it's sort of a moot point. In addition, I think that most of the comments about the game's graphics, animations, and assets are probably redundant. I mean, I think it goes without saying that every subsequent release from a studio should probably strive to improve the graphical fidelity presented and at least improve the technical stability of the code. So for me to spend like an extended period of time in this video outlining why I think they should do that just seems unnecessary. You know, they've made steps to try to improve it. I don't get the impression that they're doing sort of a CD Projekt Red rushing a game out the door before it's ready type of thing. I think it's just a matter of resources and manpower. And after the success of Kingdom Come Deliverance, I would expect that they're able to put a lot more time and money into the sequel, which is why they've been so hush-hush about it. They're working very hard trying to deliver something really special for the sequel, and they're not going to talk about it until it's ready to show off kind of a refreshing marketing strategy, isn't it? All told, I think this game is really good. Considering it's on sale regularly, I highly recommend that you check it out. It's far from perfect, but when you consider what the developers were trying to deliver to the player, I think it's a triumphant success. There's a lot of suggestions and critiques I'm going to make over the course of this video, but don't let those detract from the experience that can be garnered from the game as it stands. This is easily one of the most immersive games I've played in the last few years. It really is easy easy to fall into this world and get lost within it. You'll find yourself completing various quests and then casually looking around the city for a tavern that you stay the night in. Then you'll get up first thing in the morning, head back out onto the open road, stop by some woods to do some hunting, only to drop off the meat at a local butcher nearby for some quick coin. And before you know it, you will be living the life of a serf in this medieval land. It's pretty tremendous, if I'm being completely honest. And considering the limited resources with which this game was crafted, it's all the more impressive. And as I alluded to earlier, the game is really long. There's a lot here. There's a ton of content for you to engage in. And while I think the game could certainly benefit from some more set pieces and unique locations within the main story, I think it's generally really good. If, after watching this video, you decide to give this game a shot, I can almost guarantee that you will be embarking on one of the most grand experiences and adventures that you could possibly expect to have in a medieval video game. There will be blood, sweat, and tears, but when you finish the game, you will be starved for more, and will no doubt find yourself eagerly anticipating like myself and so many others who are fans of the game, whatever comes next. But with that, I should get into the nitty gritty. As I said, if you enjoy the video, make sure to hit the like button. It actually really does help. A ton of effort goes into these videos. They're very expensive to make. So all I ask is perhaps a little kickback with a little appreciation. Thank you. I love you. Please don't get mad at me for asking about that. And of course, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and ring the little bell. Apparently this means ringing. And also jump over to the Twitch stream if you are so inclined. I'd love to see you. Like I said, we're live pretty regularly. So come by, jump in. Say you just were watching this video and I'll probably be like, oh, that's crazy. That's super cool. I'm glad to have you. Something like that will happen. And then you can hang out as we play games or just chat or do whatever else. Now, also, I know that these videos are very, very long. These critiques are lengthy and verbose so i wanted to make it easier for you guys that's why all of these critiques not just this one are available on spotify apple podcasts and soundcloud for your listening pleasure on the go but like i said there is an expense involved so if you appreciate me doing that all i ask is that you leave a review on the little podcast page whatever it is I don't really understand it, but just leave a five-star review if you enjoy it so I know that it's worth keeping those podcasts up there. I would really appreciate it. But with all that, it's time to get going. I'll meet you on the other side of the room, not the other side of the bed. I'm going to, let's go to the desk and we'll talk about it some more. Join me. Hi, good to see you. How'd you get over there so quickly? That's crazy. Wow. High tech. What is this studio? Wow. 
It's almost like I spent way too much money on all of this stuff to get it working. <laughs> Please subscribe so I feel validated. Okay, big critique swig of water and we'll get into it. Now, like I said, this is an RPG, narrative and action mixed together. What that means is that you can expect to have branching choices within the story based on your decisions with certain characters or story beats. And then also in terms of action RPG, you can build out your character in different ways based on your play style. So if you like stealthing and lock picking a bunch, you can make that a priority. If you like straight up melee combat and nothing else, and that's what you want to role play as, you can do that. Or if you want to be a ranged fighter and just use bow and arrow and, and other stealth mechanics, you can do that too. It allows you to play the way you want, both in the story and in the combat. That's important. Now, creating a compelling narrative RPG and action RPG is not actually as simple as it sounds. Most of the time, what will end up happening is that a studio will just simply take their concept for a game and then put skill trees, put different ability loadouts, and maybe some branching narrative choices that give two or three different endings. And then they're baffled when people say, as an RPG, the game sucks. And the reason for that is because true RPGs often lie in the detail work, in the small differences and changes that take place as a result of your actions. This would be something like making one decision very early in the game and then returning later without being prompted to discover that your action had some consequence that occurred in the world without you even realizing it. I've brought it up many times before and I will bring it up again. Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I know it's a weird example to bring up, because you wouldn't think that's a great RPG, but it actually is pretty impressive. I recommend it. Did he just recommend Assassin's Creed Odyssey? What's wrong with him? Yes, I did. Chances are most of the people that criticized it didn't actually play it through to the end. Probably don't know what they're talking about. Not how I work. I played it. I really liked it. And I defended why I liked it in the three hour critique I did of the game. Wait, I more water no seriously like it's okay if you don't like the game it's totally fine but i bring this up as an example because it did something really really interesting early on basically in the starting island there is a small village that is overrun by some plague and it's killing off citizens of that small village you go to that village because your little sister character sort of kind of is friends with a small girl that lives there too with her family you arrive at that small village and the family is about to be executed because it's the only thing the local governing forces can think of to contain the plague. So then the game asks you what should happen. You can intervene killing the guards that are going to kill the family to try to save the rest of the island. In which case, your little sister character will be very thankful that you just saved her friend from being gutted like a fish. But something interesting will happen much later. And of course you can let them just like execute the family and that's it. You tell your little sister, like sometimes hard decisions have to be made and you go about your business. But if you leave the area for like 20, 30, 40 hours of gameplay time and then return back, that decision has an impact. If you return after having the family executed out of an abundance of caution for the plague, You'll find that village totally refurbished, totally fine. Everybody's healthy going about their business like normal. It's totally fine. But if you chose to save the family, even though they probably had the plague, you will come back to piles of dead bodies stacked up high, burning corpses everywhere because the plague has spread since you didn't allow them to stop it at the source. Oh, and Alexios, in all the excitement, I nearly forgot. Terrible things have happened to your home. That old house, it was barely standing to begin with. I meant Kefalonia. A sickness has spread across the island. They say it started in Kausos. There doesn't seem to be a cure. Many have died. Malaka, that priest was right. Damn. And again, the really good touch is that they didn't force you to see that. You could have played through the rest of the game, never returned to that area, and you would have had no idea that that choice had a consequence. But it did. 
and that's what's really impressive. It's what I've referred to before as the insecurity of a lot of game design nowadays where developers feel like they need to really clearly show you everything that they do and how every system works with painstaking and annoying clarity. Like, there's no finesse, there's no confidence anymore with these big AAA games. And that's why I think games like Elden Ring are so refreshing, because they don't hold your hand and they don't feel the need to walk you through every step of the way. They can be like, yeah, we've got 100 plus bosses in the game. Are we going to tell you where they all are? No, go find them. Figure it out. We've got tons of weapons. Are we going to tell you where they all are? No, go figure it out. The game's really good. You'll enjoy it. We're going to tell you how to go through it, what the exact story route is. No, figure it out. It's why that's so refreshing. And similar really good small touches and attention to detail are present within Kingdom Come Deliverance. An example would be this time when I choked out this guard and stole his armor right off of his unconscious body. I didn't kill him. I left him alive. And I really didn't think much of it. And so I went about my business and used the armor to my benefit. After some time had went by, I was exploring the castle once again for a side quest that I had started elsewhere. And I found that same guard on patrol in his underwear. You see, he didn't have the money or resources to actually go and buy new armor because I'm sure as far as the leadership was concerned, it was his fault that he had lost it. Like, who's going to believe that somebody knocked him out and then stole his armor off his body without him waking up? Like, nobody would believe that. So being a man of honor, he still went on patrol in his tidy whities It's great. This was genuinely funny when we found it out on stream, and it's a really good touch. But I will say it would have been even better if he had noticed that I was wearing the very things that had just been stolen off of his body like a day or two before. And I get it, like all of the armor sets look identical, so perhaps it would be really hard to identify. But even if it was just a small comment where he says like, hey, that looks really familiar. My my tunic had a stain on it just like that. And my chest plate had a dent in it just like that. Huh. Just something like that. It would have been great. But you know what? This will do. But even so, it's a really good touch. And it's these little touches that bring the game across the finish line and help take it from just another RPG to something that actually feels like it's contained within a living, breathing world with rules set up that the NPCs and the players have to deal with. And speaking of these rules that apply not just to you, but also to the NPCs in the world, the developers really put a lot of effort into making sure that your actions were reflected in the reactions of NPCs and villagers. For example, if you get into a combat encounter and receive damage, get blood on your clothes, or have cuts and bruises, NPCs will see that. They will comment on it, and often they will treat you differently throughout the conversation. If they are a merchant, it may affect their opinion of you to the point where they charge differing amounts for items or are less willing to barter. It would basically be like a merchant looks at you and sees that you're dirty and kind of gross and assumes that you're not very intelligent or that you aren't well-versed in the art of bartering. So they offer you a higher price to begin with for a set item, whereas if you came in wearing nice clothes and very perfumed and looking very erudite, they would treat you much differently, much more kindly because they look at this person and say, oh, this is a guy with money. This is a real man. You know, it's exactly like Pretty Woman. Like that is this gameplay system. Excuse me, sir. Yes. I was here yesterday and you refused to wait on me. But in my experience, sometimes this isn't as comprehensive as one might expect. I mean, again, we're talking about janky behavior in the game, certainly present here too. Such as in this example, when we're playing as Teresa and she's just totally mauled by a wild dog and an archery teacher then comments on this and says that she looks like she was just attacked because she was. But when the camera pans back to her, she looks 
totally fine. Now this was probably just a bug where like cuts, scratches, bruises, and blood textures just failed to load in. So her base model was displayed when it should have been a model reflecting the damage that she had just received. But regardless of the cause of this discrepancy, it's still a little jarring. The system that's working here is really cool. I love the idea that something as simple as blood on your shirt could affect the way that NPCs treat you. It's super cool to me, but it is a little bit of a bummer that moments like these can be undermined by something as simple as a texture not loading in properly. Once again, this may just be me. I have historically exhibited a low tolerance for bugs, glitches, and the like, so you may never have noticed this, or if you did, you may not have cared. But whether or not you were personally affected by this in a negative way, it doesn't really change the fact that this is a problem. In whatever sequel comes out, if they can keep these systems the same, but simply refine them to the point where they work the way they are intended every single time, that game will be a huge success. And this is something you'll probably see time and time again as we go through these systems in this video. Most of my biggest problems with Kingdom Come Deliverance aren't with the overarching design. It's that I love the systems they put in here, but they just don't work the way they're supposed to every single time, all the time. They work really well like 80% of the time and then 20% of the time they just don't work at all. And it's frustrating because if it could just work the right way every single time, it'd be so great, but it just can't quite get there. Again, it's double A jank, but just because it's janky doesn't mean that it's totally forgivable or that it's actually endearing to the point where it's better than if it just worked the right way to begin with. The combat system, for example, is actually quite robust with its variable parrying, combos, and various weapon effects such as bleeding. But unfortunately, it often feels as though it's not running on all cylinders. It can feel really laggy such that your attacks and deflections don't trigger properly or promptly, leading to the whole sword fighting system often feeling as though you're just swinging sticks around underwater. Or all of the countless times where my stamina drained all the way down to the bottom very, very quickly to the point where enemies were able to stun lock me like your basic runt enemy in a From Software game. Literally, all they have to do in a sequel to make me and many other players happy is refine these systems and get them working the way that they probably should be working to begin with. Make them more responsive and polish the ever-living hell out of it, and I will be a very happy camper. But with that, we need to get into more specifics about the combat and general gameplay systems. But before we do that, I need to do a quick costume change. Okay, quick transition. Here we go. Ready? And just like that, we changed outfits. How crazy is that? We live in the future. Now we need to talk about combat, because that's what most people are going to get hung up on when they play Kingdom Come Deliverance for the first time, and for a good reason. It's unique. Firstly, I want to touch on close quarters combat. Say that ten times fast. Close quarters combat, close quarter combat, close quarter... Uh, I can't. I can't do it. I'm not... I'm not... <laughs> I don't know. There's no more to that bit. It was just like, say this thing fast. And then I, I started saying it fast and I was like, oh, that's not that hard to say. Well, now I feel like a dummy. <laughs> so, yeah, moving on. <laughs> so the combat system in this game is extremely polarizing. Some people will say that it takes time to master and has enough finesse involved that it keeps things interesting but others will say that it's simply bad. It's clunky and it's painfully unfair at times. And over the course of my time with the game, I've fallen on both sides of this spectrum and practically everywhere in between, depending on when you would ask me this question, I would probably have a different answer. When the game begins, the sword fighting will certainly feel extremely difficult for all the wrong reasons. It isn't like a From Software title where the combat is difficult because it always feels fair. Though, after Elden Ring, perhaps always feels fair as in and of itself not fair. We'll talk all about that in the Elden Ring critique that is uh, quickly approaching, so make sure to subscribe to get notified of when that video goes live. Regardless, it's important that if a game has a difficult combat system, it deals out damage and punishment to the player in a fair and even-handed way. If I'm in the middle of a boss fight, it's crucial that any damage I receive is damage that I deserved to receive. 
After all, video games are, at the end of the day, very simple machines. They set the stage in a certain way, establish rules that govern the actions and activities on that stage, and then they let things play out while enforcing those rules. If the game doesn't enforce those rules evenly, or if things occur that shouldn't, it doesn't feel fair anymore. And the whole experience begins to crumble because fun and enjoyment and satisfaction are all tied to whether or not an experience is fair. This is why at an amusement park, it sort of spoils the fun. If you've been waiting in line for one ride for two hours, and then you see the pricks with the fast passes just waltz on after two minutes. I get it, they paid more for their fast pass, but they're still pricks. Though granted, maybe I'm just immature, and that's why I find that type of thing upsetting, and why it's all the funnier to me that I also go and get fast passes at amusement parks, because I like to become the very thing that I hate, but who knows? Who knows? Now, like I said, I think this is why Elden Ring has been so polarizing. For many, its extreme lack of balance, its bugs, the exploits, and the inconsistent performance all have led to an experience that was greatly diminished. And part of the reason why that was such a remarkable occurrence in that game is that it was coming from a development studio that's known for avoiding these pitfalls. In Kingdom Come Deliverance, this is par for the course, unfortunately. Almost every single mechanic that we're going to be discussing over the course of this video is built on shaky foundations. They may be interesting or even novel in their ideation, but their implementation leaves much to be desired. Whether we look at the bartering system, the in-game marketplaces for buying and selling items, the combat itself, or any other number of systems, they all crumble under their own weight. But sticking with combat for now, it's fairly simple. When wielding a weapon, you are able to attack from five different directions in addition to a stab move that you can throw in. Using the right stick on a controller or the mouse on a PC, you can choose the angle of your attack to try and take advantage of holes left in your opponent's defenses. For example, if they are guarding to the left, you will want to swap your attack so that it's coming from the right, or if they're guarding low, you want to swap to attack from up high. It's pretty simple, and it will bring back many memories of games like For Honor that used similar systems. Going with this directionality mechanic, your defense of moves are built off of the same premise. In this case, when an attack is coming from the left, you want to defend to the left. And this creates a sort of fluid combat that results in you dancing with your opponent, blocking their attacks and responding with your own in turn. You can also unlock different combo moves as you level up Henry. These can be as simple as a single slash or as complex as four or five combined moves. In addition, all of your damage is going to be filtered through that weapon that you do have equipped. And obviously, some weapons are going to be better than others, and some have different attack styles than others. Long swords will give you greater range, but they'll cause you to move more slowly. Short swords will allow you to get up close and personal while maintaining some agility, but their damage is extremely limited, especially against heavily armored opponents. And so on and so forth. And all of this sounds great. You can really understand why the game directors would have gone in this direction after being told all of this stuff during the early development meetings when they were pitched these systems. It makes sense. It sounds fluid. It sounds great. The problem is that they aren't implemented well. It may be an engine issue, or maybe a low-level issue with the game's programming, or it may simply be that I just don't like it, but this never felt fluid like I think it meant to feel. Pretty clearly, they wanted combat to turn into a dance. However, there is a slight delay to everything you do. When you attack, Henry has to work up the energy, shift his feet, and move into position before he swings. And every time you tap the left mouse button, it feels like you're signing up to do a four-hour guided tour on horseback through the mountains before you even start the attack. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. There are certainly ways to design a combat system where the player has to commit to certain movements and watch them play out, but in this game, it never feels as though it's wholly intentional. You will spend so much time in combat wrestling with the controls that often you aren't focused on what your opponent is doing, but rather just on trying to get Henry to do what you want him to do. It's like those moments when you're playing an Assassin's Creed game and the character just leaps off a building to their doom, even though you simply wanted them to climb up a small ledge. It's like that, 
if it were turned into a dedicated gameplay system. And as you get more acclimated with the combat, you will learn how to wrestle with these controls and you'll probably start to find it easier. I know I certainly did. But one of the things that's really difficult to quantify is whether or not I was actually getting better at the combat or if my tolerance for its eccentricities was growing. And after much reflection, I think the answer is probably the latter. Though certainly both are at play somewhat. I think you do get used to wrestling with the controls, which makes you better at wrestling with them, and therefore better at the combat, but you also are getting better at dealing with something that you shouldn't have to deal with in the first place. I did eventually get to the point where I could reliably parry, deflect, or dodge almost every enemy attack that came in. However, I never felt that I was as capable a fighter as my opponents. When I took a charged, heavy swing at them, they were able to slip quickly past me with a swift slash under my armpit. But when they did the same to me, the best I could do is strafe to the left and then take a big swing that took three seconds to prepare. And I'll say before somebody leaves a comment mentioning it below, and that would be that perhaps this is sort of a meta-commentary on combat in this day and age in a medieval setting and how it would be sluggish and difficult, especially starting out. Maybe the reason the combat is difficult is because Henry, a blacksmith's son, wouldn't be good at combat himself, at least not to start. So it only makes sense that they would lead the player into feeling the same way. And in response, I would say that there are certainly times when this sort of design philosophy is justified and even cool to see. A great example would be Red Dead Redemption 2. Spoilers real quick for Red Dead 2 if you haven't played it for some reason yet and you want to. I will spoil the end of that game in just a second. So skip forward about 30 seconds to avoid it. Still here? Cool. Towards the end of Red Dead Redemption 2, Arthur gets sick. Over the course of the whole game, you've been gaining stats in your health, stamina, dead eye skills, but once he grows ill, these stats begin to decrease, introducing the same handicap to the player as Arthur is experiencing. But in this case, with Kingdom Come Deliverance, I don't actually think it was intentional. I just don't see any reason to believe that any of this, the stiffness in combat or anything else, was carefully calculated as a meta critique on the game's themes. Rather, I think it's just a crappy combat system that doesn't work very well. Sometimes the simpler answer is the correct one. And in this case, I think it's just clunky and it doesn't really work as well as we would all like it to. Another place the combat struggles is in its handling of multiple enemies. By default, the game tries to balance between enemies that are aggro against you. It'll lock on to the one that it thinks you are trying to look at, and then it'll stick on to that character until you try to swing your view hard enough in a different direction that it detaches that automatic lock and focuses on a new one. Or if you want to avoid it randomly detaching, you can simply tap tab on PC and it will hard lock on one particular enemy and then you can tap the key again at which point it will swap to a different one. And this is all fine and dandy when you're dealing with one enemy on screen, but when you have a horde of two, three, or more enemies, everything goes to absolute crap. Look at all of these examples on screen. It's almost impossible to stick to one enemy while also strafing around them to get better positions such that you can avoid damage from the others. Furthermore, the auto lock-on is infuriating when you're trying to cut and run. You will turn away, disengaging the lock-on with the enemy, and you will try to run in the opposite direction because likely you aren't prepared to handle multiple enemies or you find it so infuriatingly clunky that you simply don't want to deal with multiple enemies at one time. And I gotta tell you, there was never an occasion in my whole experience with this game where I ever went, I want to go find multiple enemies to fight because it's fun, satisfying, and well-designed. Never once. Every time I faced an encounter where I had to deal with two plus enemies, I actively looked for ways out of that situation because it was so clunky and so poorly thought through on the part of the developers. Like, if you're gonna have a clunky system that you know doesn't respond well to multiple enemies, don't put multiple enemies in countless scenes throughout the game. Seems pretty simple to me. Find an excuse for only one enemy attacking you at a time. Maybe it's for sake of nobility and being honorable. Everybody that you fight wants to fight you mano a mano, man to man, and that's how they wanna go. 
that would work fine. And I think we would all forgive the narrative consequences of that being a little unbelievable, especially with the invaders and the aggression from bandits who don't necessarily have a sense of honor themselves. But at the very least, then we would avoid these really awful encounters where you can't even cut and run properly because for some reason the game will try to help you in these situations and refocus your view on an enemy nearby even if they are literally 180 degrees away from your focal point that's right the game will literally turn you around completely to lock on to an enemy who is trying to attack you while you are actively running away and I cannot begin to describe how many times I wanted to rage quit this game because of this. And it's made all the more frustrating because this is something that seems very reasonable for Henry to do within the game's setting and story. If Henry were to stumble on an encampment full of all sorts of different enemies that want to kill him, it's unlikely that he would try to go 1v10 against them. Rather, it seems much more reasonable that he would want to turn around, sprint to his horse, mount it, and flee. But the game's auto lock system is so poorly designed that it will make something as simple as running away a chore that you have to wrestle with. And there are systems in place in the game right now that should fix this entirely, whether it's requiring you to uh, equip your fists, as it were, to begin fighting. That would fix this. The problem is if you have your sword out and you unequip it by sheathing it, thinking that that will then disengage you from combat and then you can run away and sprint, hop on your horse and leave, that doesn't actually do it because he puts away his sword and then tries to fight with his fists. You're always ready to go and it, it just doesn't work. It's not thought through very well and it ends up being incredibly frustrating. I'm sure there are mods that have fixed this, but it doesn't change the fact that the game shipped with this issue. And practically every single system that's related in any way to combat feels like you are actively wrestling with controls that don't want you to be successful. Maybe I'm just a stickler, but I prefer combat systems that are difficult because they require careful consideration, practice, and even research. I don't like combat systems that require the player to juggle controls that don't want to cooperate and that feel broken. We've said it many, many times. Perception is often more important than reality when it comes to players' interpretations and feelings of a game and its features. If a player thinks that something is a bug, it basically is. It doesn't matter if that was a feature you put in the game. If players think that something's not working right, it's probably not working the way that it should be. In the same way that if players feel like the combat is clunky and unfun, it doesn't matter if that was intentional or sort of a meta decision to make combat difficult so you feel like the player character. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the player thinks that your thing isn't very good. But let's touch on ranged combat briefly. Both ranged combat and hunting with the bow feels about the same. Without mods, there is no reticle for the bow and arrow. You simply have to practice and learn roughly where the arrow is going to go in relation to Henry's hand and the bow itself on screen. Furthermore, when you pull the string back, Henry will begin to shake so violently under the strain of holding his breath that it will make an already frustratingly hard to use bow and arrow feel punishingly bad. As I mentioned, there are mods that can be downloaded which fix some of these things, or to avoid the term fix, make them much easier to use. However, I'm not here to critique mods for this game. I'm here to discuss what the game presents to the player when you purchase it or when you download it from something like Game Pass, though this was removed from Game Pass a while back and I, I hope they bring it back. Maybe it's back by the time you're watching this video, but uh, as of the time of writing the script and doing this, it's not currently present, which is a bummer. No matter how I look at it, all of the combat systems in Kingdom Come Deliverance are clunky, poorly implemented, or they're just downright broken. In fact, the combat is so bad that I actively avoided engagements if I could help it because I was so annoyed by how frustratingly difficult it was for all the wrong reasons. Again, it would be one thing if I was avoiding combat for narrative reasons. Maybe I'm a pacifist. Maybe there's sort of a morality system at play that makes me not want to tarnish my good name by freely engaging in combat wherever I went. But instead, it's simply because the combat is so poor and unfun that I actively wanted to avoid engaging in it. 
And I don't think it needs to be said, but I will say it anyways. If you have a video game with a major gameplay mechanic that players avoid using because it's so unfun, that's a problem that should be fixed. Now, I don't want to be overly or excessively pessimistic and critical, but there really isn't much I can say about the combat that's positive. It really is just bad as far as I'm concerned. Over the course of my time with the game and as we played it on stream, I learned how to wrestle with the controls and some tips and tricks to overcome its eccentricities, but that's not to be confused with learning to love or master it. It's like driving a pickup from 1983. It doesn't run very well, and to get it to the point where it will take you from destination A to B, you have to learn to hold the key in the ignition with your pinky finger while turning the wheel left when you want to go to the right and shifting gears with your knee, all while pulling over every three minutes to pour water into the coolant tank because it keeps overheating. Like, you can learn how to work with it. It can even service your needs, but that doesn't make it a good car, and that certainly doesn't excuse its faults. In other words, just because somebody can learn how to use the combat system in this game doesn't mean that it's good. But you know what? All of that's bumming me out. I want to talk about some of the stuff that this game does that's really good. Let's talk about that. Quests. These are pretty varied. Early quests, like the Miller's quest line to find the ring on the body that he finds somewhat lucrative, are fairly monotonous, and there will be a lot of them early in the game. In this case, you just have to go to the grave, come back, he sends you back out, and then you come back again. It's like a fetch quest on steroids, where you go to the same location two or three times, learning a little bit more information that's useful every time you go. Now, the fact that these early quests are so lame is bizarre, because it's actually set up in a very competent way. For example, you wake up from your coma with a lot of wounds. Your clothes are also dirty and you could use some refreshment. So, along the way to the quest objective that most players will be engaging with, there's a bathhouse that players can use to refresh themselves. Here, you can also refine your use of the barter system to get the price down, sell certain objects that you don't need anymore, and you can also get to a good base position before venturing out into the woods. And I love these kinds of designs in video games. They don't shove it down your throat or give you a big heads-up display notification informing you of your proximity to such a service provider, but instead, they put it along the way that you're going to be traveling down and trust that players who are exploring and attempting to identify useful items will find it. And I know I say this in most of the critiques that we do, but it really does hold true. Many of the ills that plague modern AAA game design are centered around the developer's lack of trust and faith in their player base. They hold their hand too much and make things overly complicated by way of over-communication of objectives. Sometimes, less is more. And I'm glad to see that in Kingdom Come Deliverance, they understand this. So while the opening hours of the game offer some side quests that are repetitive, the opening main story is actually quite compelling. There are multiple major set pieces, all sorts of cinematics carefully rendered. Everything is done pretty well, and it's compelling, both emotionally and in terms of gameplay, to get the player interested and invested in the hours to come. The primary plot of Kingdom Come Deliverance is centered around revenge, because some bad guys invaded your home village slash castle, and as a result, they killed your mom and dad, and so you are in a quest for revenge. And the story will take you all across your native land, discovering all sorts of new locations, meeting tons of new people, and engaging in lots of combat along the way on this grand, vast journey to avenge your family. It's nothing too special, and while I don't think the main story is what's going to compel most people to play the game, it does motivate the player's actions in these early hours enough to get them invested in this world. And while it may motivate the player in the short term, what inevitably will happen is that players will feel very motivated to get revenge on behalf of their family, and as a result, they will start to go through the main story quest lines, acquire different materials, weaponry, explore different locations, fight different enemies, and all the while they're gaining knowledge of this world and abilities and status. And before they know it, you might end up in the position where you're ready to just move on from your family's trials and tribulations and just accept that something bad happened, but that you're living a decent life in this world now, a life that you could have only dreamt of prior to all of these events occurring. 
and you're almost okay with it and you're ready to just move on. And while Henry doesn't catch up to the player's thoughts as quickly as I, I think he probably should, it is relatively uh, interesting that both the player and Henry ultimately line up, I think, by the end of the story. It's, it's interesting because it does a really good job of taking the player along for the same ride that Henry's on and keeping that very, very tight knit, though I do think that players end up a little bit ahead of Henry, at least in terms of coming to grips with his situation. I mean, granted, if if like everybody who played this game had their families die in a horrific raid on their village, then perhaps they would be less willing to just move on and run around hunting deer. But you know what? That's probably not a realistic or reasonable ask of the developers, you know, help players get immersed by killing their families. <laughs> You know, I don't think that would sell. Now, furthermore, a lot of quests don't seem to fully anticipate or accommodate for situations where, for example, you need to collect certain information or abilities or items after the initial interaction. For example, there's this quest where you need to hunt down an individual who you think is responsible, or at least has knowledge of, a recent raid on some villagers. However, you and the townspeople discover him brutally murdered in a house on the outskirts of town. So you go inside and inspect the body, and you can discover various items such as the condition of his body, the way in which he was killed, armor that he has laying on the ground next to him, and some writing in blood on the wall behind him. Now at this point in the game, some players will have learned how to read from the scribe that's in this same city, and others will not have gotten to it just yet. Likely because they stopped by this quest marker before carrying on to the scribe who's further through the city. The problem, though, is that if you inspect this body before learning how to read, Henry will simply say, oh shucks, too bad I can't read, when looking at the text scrawled in the wall in blood. But if you have learned how to read at this point, he can read it and interpret it, and it helps your investigation. And I, like many other players I'm sure, thought that I was being crafty when I went to learn how to read right after I saw this body and the writing on the wall, something we will discuss in a moment, and then I returned to the scene of the crime to see if the letters were still on the wall so that I could read them with my newfound ability. And while the body had been removed by that point, which makes sense because it supposedly took a few in-game days to learn how to read, the blood that comprised the text did remain on the wall. So I excitedly ran up to the wall to inspect it to see if I could read what had been undecipherable just a few days before, but there was no prompt, not even one to even attempt to read the text. Even though Henry could read at this point in the game and there is a bloody message scrawled on the wall with information I needed, I can't even attempt to read it. Maybe this was a bug or something, but regardless of the cause, it still struck me as odd and it was very frustrating. There's no reason that I shouldn't be able to read this message now and apply the knowledge gained to my investigation. The only reason for me not to be able to read it is if it was an oversight by the developers or a bug or a glitch that prevented me from being given the option to read it. But either way, it was really disappointing to see. I thought I was being resourceful, but in the end, I guess I was just being naive, expecting this to work. But as I touched on before, there are some ways that the game teaches you activities that are really novel and cool, so much so that they may be among the best implemented tutorials that I've ever seen in a game like this. And the clearest example that I could probably point to would be something like the aforementioned experience of learning how to read. Here you are tasked with writing to a nearby city and hiring a scribe to teach you how to read. In most games you would probably just go speak to the scribe, a short montage would play through a cutscene, and then you would load back in with a newfound ability. But in this game you actually go through the process of learning how to read. Now chances are if you're playing this game you already know how to read, so the way that the developers made you feel like you were struggling as much as Henry is that they shuffled around some of the letters in the texts that you are tasked with reading. This makes it so you are struggling to decipher the messages just as much as Henry is, and it was actually really cool. At first, I'm gonna be honest, I thought I was having a dyslexic attack. I like kind of took a moment to recalibrate, take a drink of water, I was like, okay, I've been playing too long, my vision is blurry, letters are mixing up, but no, it was intentional. You see, I realized what they were doing and it was actually pretty cool. 
In these hyper-realistic RPGs, one of the most important things is maintaining immersion. In other words, making the player feel like they are in the world that the player character inhabits. And this isn't just done with one or two tricks of the trade, but rather with an obsessive adherence to the rules established. In Kingdom Come Deliverance, one of those rules is that if the character is struggling with something, the player usually needs to struggle with it as well. And this means that if Henry would struggle to find shelter in the middle of the night whilst exhausted and starving, the player should also have to struggle with that same problem. It shouldn't be an easy fix because it wouldn't be for Henry in that situation. And the same is true in the case of learning how to read. For obvious reasons, they can't replicate the weeks or months long process of learning how to read, but they can provide a montage and then a sequence where the player struggles to interpret texts placed in front of them, allowing them to empathize with the player character. And amazingly, it's also not just reading. This is implemented in other situations too. Like I said, these principles of immersion apply to many other systems in this game, and they're all implemented very well. This results in a game that's easy to become immersed within and that is punishing to boot. However, what I discovered fairly early on is that while there is an initial struggle to learn the game's systems and the rules of engagement, once you've played for a dozen or so hours, you'll likely feel right at home. Making sure that you have enough fresh food and shelter planned out for the following evening, it won't feel like a chore anymore, but rather it's just part of your daily routine in-game. Earning money may be a struggle in the early game, but pretty soon you'll have your favorite hunting spots to go out to, get some deer, and you'll have a poacher that you have a relationship with nearby that you can sell it to. And as the hours of gameplay tick by, you will start to realize that you aren't just playing through the game, completing various objectives as you're instructed, but you're actually living in the game world. You're doing all of the basic tasks that you would have to do if you were actually there, and it's become second nature to you. And this is why people who finish this game speak of it so highly, because it's not just a game for them. It's another world. It's an escape. Sure, it's janky and clunky, and there's a lot that could be improved and refined in a sequel, but this game is still tremendously successful in providing players with an experience that's immersive and captivating. And the fact that it's so clunky in parts, I think is a testament to how well the rest of it is put together. Even with those systems that don't work properly, at least not all the time, it's still fantastic. And it begs the question just how amazing a sequel could be if they could just cut more of the gristle and polish down the gems. Now this next little bit I was going to just let be sort of a, a offhanded mention, but the more I thought about it, the more I felt that it should get its own section, because it's not just an immersive system within the gameplay loop or the combat. It's something that's a huge staple that initially will frustrate players, but eventually becomes something that makes a lot of sense. I'm talking about saving in the game. Let's take a brief moment to discuss this. There are a few basic ways that saving can be completed. Firstly, there are checkpoints throughout the quests that you will be engaging with, which make sure that you don't lose a lot of progress if you happen to die in a particularly difficult boss fight after a long cutscene, or in a sequence that's especially grating. The second option for saving is when you rest at beds throughout the game. These have to be beds that you have either paid for or that you own yourself. This means that you can't just break into somebody's house or a hovel to sleep in their bed so that you can save the game quickly. It has to be a bed that you have an in-game justification for sleeping in, such as renting a bed at an inn or tavern, or going back to a safe house where you actually own the bed in question. And the third option is to save with an item in-game called Savior Schnapps. This is an item that can be crafted or bought from vendors throughout the game. Drinking it will allow you to effectively quick save in overly sticky situations. And this latter save method is the one that I am mostly interested in. I'll be honest, when I first played this game, I absolutely hated that this is how the quick save system worked. In my mind, this is a narrative RPG with many branching paths for the story to take. And I viewed this restriction on quick saving as an unneeded restriction on player agency. 
In effect, I was thinking, if your game's consequences are built out so well, why don't you let me test them? Why can't I click save quickly and try out all of my options without using a very difficult to acquire item? But my opinion on this topic has actually evolved as I've played more of the game. Okay, after writing that, I really feel like a pretentious dick because I'm suggesting that my opinion is automatically better than yours since it's evolved. If you happen to disagree with what I'm about to run down, that's totally fine. Just know that I don't mean evolve in like a derogatory way. I just mean it like I feel as though I've discovered new things as I've played through the game that make me feel more justified in this newfound position. And I think I can defend it. But if you disagree, that's totally fine. You're you're good. You're good. I'm sorry if that sounded crude. You see, I think it perfectly reasonable to say that some in-game mechanics are geared towards different player experience levels. Early in the game, when the developers are trying to teach the player how to use every major system, how to speak with NPCs, how to interrogate their surroundings, and even how to develop a playstyle of their own, adding in the complexity of a quick save system seems unnecessary. I think there are bigger fish to fry in these opening hours. If quick saving was as easy a task as simply tapping the F5 key, players would be spending the opening hours of the game sitting at chests and quick saving their way into locked chests all around the map. They would be quick saving around guards and into hidden areas and into the pockets of those who possess items valuable for a starting player. Because this is the big thing to remember and it's it's just true. There's no way around it as far as I'm concerned. And that is that if you give players the ability to do something, they'll do it. It doesn't matter if it's like going to ruin the fun for them. It doesn't matter if it's missing the, the point of the game. They're going to do it. If there's a broken gun in Warzone, players are going to use it because everybody else is using it. If there's a loadout in Elden Ring that's really powerful against a really tough boss, players are going to use it. It doesn't matter if you think they should or shouldn't. It's going to happen. If the player can spam quick save to get past difficult locks, they're going to do it. If there's a 1% chance of successfully pickpocketing somebody who has a lot of coin in their pocket, they're going to quick load until they get it. Now, certainly not every player is going to do it, but enough players will do it that it will affect the experience of the general player base. And to be frank, I can understand why the developers didn't want to juggle the in-game balancing to an extreme degree to prevent such an abuse of the game systems, removing all sorts of locked crates and valuable items from the inventory of various characters early in the game, only to reintroduce them to those same characters later on. Of course, you can still cheese some of the mechanisms in Kingdom Come Deliverance, just as you can with every other game, but the point is that it's far more difficult to do so early in the game when the dev team is trying to establish the rules of engagement. Save your schnapps are expensive early in the game for new players, and the only way most players will get them is either by selling everything else in their possession or by stealing it from NPCs. And this means that even if a player wants to try and cheese chests to get inside, and even if they are successful in doing that, that's the one time that they're going to be able to exploit the game's quick save system until they find another chance to acquire this expensive item, which often is a trudge in and of itself. In effect, it's not really an exploit if players have to spend a ton of time and effort getting to the point where they can actually exploit it. It's like having a really powerful weapon in a game like Elden Ring that's really hard to get to. It's like, well, is it an exploit if it's super tough to get it? Or is it just a really awesome reward for players who are resourceful and working hard to get something cool. Early in the game, I think this works really well. It forces players to progress along in a more natural way without relying on exploits to get along faster. It's one of my problems with games like Fallout New Vegas or Cyberpunk 2077 because they give the player the opportunity to spam quick save and quick loads. And as a result, players often spend the opening hours of a given game learning to exploit that tool instead of learning how to play the game in its purest form with all of the systems and without a abusing a quick load 
quick save system. In my mind, one of the great things about a game such as Fallout New Vegas when it works properly is that a choice you make has severe consequences. If you tried to pickpocket a civilian and they catch you in the act, you're going to deal with the long-term ramifications of that choice, the negative effects on that faction that you're going to suffer with the endings of the game, etc. Just like you would have to deal with the consequences of those actions in real life. I understand that there may be a really cool weapon that you want, but that is locked behind a very hard lockpick difficulty gate. And sure, you can spam your way in there, quick saving before you begin picking it and then reloading every time you fail. But I would say quite clearly in my mind, that isn't the way you're supposed to play the game. I know, I know, I know. Suggesting that there is a right or wrong way to play an RPG like Fallout New Vegas or Kingdom Come Deliverance or Cyberpunk 2077 or The Witcher 3, all of those, it gets people riled up. And I, I can understand and respect that. And I'm not saying anything bad or horrible should happen to you if you happen to be somebody that enjoys quick loading to break dialogue sequences or to get into hard to lockpick crates. Like, I'm not saying we should string you up and, and take you out of town on a railroad. I, I don't think that's that bad of an offense. Play the game the way you want it. If it's a single player game and you're not hurting anybody, go for it. I just really don't think that spamming quick save and quick load to get past difficulty gates that the developers put in place for a reason. I just don't think that that's actually playing the game the way the developers intended it. Because if they put a difficulty gate, such as a really hard to get past door with a very hard lock pick on it, they put that there for a reason. You're only supposed to be able to lockpick it if you can do very hard lockpicks with reliability consistently. That's the expectation. And so for you to just randomly quick load and quick save until you stumble into the correct combination without totally screwing it up, that to me bypasses the very intention that the developers had when they placed that gate there. Perhaps the simplest way of explaining it is just to say that if the developers wanted you to spam quick load to get around a locked chest, a door, or a difficult speech check, they would simply have not put those checks in the game and they simply would have let you pass. The whole point of a difficulty check is that it is exactly what it sounds like, a difficult check. If you can exploit your way around it by spamming quick save and quick load, it isn't actually a difficulty check. It's just a tedious speed bump that doesn't challenge the player to grow their character or improve their build out. But rather, it just demands the patience of a catatonic monk to sit through loading screens as you zip back to your previous quick save and try for the umpteenth time to clear it. All of this to say, I was initially really skeptical of the Saver Schnapps because I felt as though they were unnecessarily difficult to acquire in the early game and they punished the player for experimentation again in the early game. But after more consideration, I've changed my mind and I can now confidently say that this was a good call by the developers. It still gives players the ability to quick save in certain situations that are particularly deserving, but it discourages the exploitation of the game's systems by players who are looking for the easiest possible path to high level loot and a healthy coin purse early in the game. It trains players to play the game properly the first time so that once they get access to that quick save system using the savior schnapps reliably and regularly, they don't need the savior schnapps and they'll only use them in situations that really demand it, such as extremely difficult combat encounters or before attempting some strange dialogue option that they wouldn't normally try. It's also really nice because it forces players to go and find regular places to sleep in order to save that way and to go through the main story so that they reach those saving checkpoints regularly. In other words, once again, it keeps players on a pretty straight and narrow path learning how to play the game the right way before they're given the ability to do something more freely. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is something that I really did not expect to have a somewhat positive opinion of, because in almost every single game that I see systems like this, I end up absolutely hating that. And that is weapon and armor degradation. You see, Kingdom Come Deliverance has weapon degradation. Basically, the more you use a weapon or armor, the quicker it will degrade and lose its potency. If left unrepaired, eventually the weapon or armor piece will grow basically unusable. Now, like I said, I've stated many times in the past that I usually find these systems 
very annoying. They just seemed overly tedious. In a game like Breath of the Wild, the only reason that weapons degrade so quickly is so that players are encouraged to continue exploring so that they can find new weapons to keep in their inventory for the next combat encounter. And that's all fine and dandy, but I don't think it's a worthy trade when you consider just how annoying it is to collect a weapon only to lose it within a single combat encounter because it degrades so quickly. So what it often leads to is a phenomenon where the player doesn't want to use the quality gear that they've collected because they don't want it to break or degrade. So inevitably, players will just keep those high-end weapons and armors hidden away in chests or in the depths of their inventory, never to use them. In my mind, if you have a gameplay system that results in players avoiding participation in it, it's just not very well implemented. However, in Kingdom Come Deliverance, this is justified more narratively. For one, this game is supposed to be much more grounded and realistic than, for example, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. So it makes sense in this world that your weapons and armor would slowly break down and need repair, especially after combat encounters where they would inevitably get beaten up. Secondly, your weapons and armor degrade at a slow enough pace that it Honestly, it, it feels fair. I can't actually think of an instance where I was playing the game, noticed that a weapon or armor piece I had been using was degraded, and I said to myself, what, already? It just, it didn't happen. And that's because it degraded slowly enough that it, honestly, it just felt fair. It didn't feel as though I just put this on. Are you kidding me? It's broken. I'm going to kill someone. Like, it, it never got there. I always felt as though, eh, that's fair. I was just in a combat encounter. I got the crap beat out of me. Yeah, it makes sense that my armor's dinged up. I'll go back to the blacksmith. And I think this is the key takeaway. If the game is going to introduce a system that holds the player to a higher standard, it's important that it's fairly implemented across the board. Having a tedious weapon degradation system that's difficult to use and that isn't justified in the narrative results in a feeling that this isn't actually cohesive with the broader structures of the game. But if everything is fluidly tied together, such that the systems complement each other and feel grounded in the game world, you can have a gameplay system that contributes to the player's level of immersion instead of detracting from it. But to be specific, how it works is that in this game, you will use your weapons and armor that you've collected throughout the game until they break down. You can do small repairs on them yourself with certain kits that you'll also have collected in the world or purchased from local vendors, but for major repairs, you'll need to see a blacksmith or an armorer, or just buy new gear. Now these guys can be very expensive, so it's important to only go to them when absolutely necessary, such as in the aforementioned case where your equipment is severely damaged and needs massive repairs. But once you go to them, pony up the cost, your gear is as good as new. Again, I don't mind this because it's justified in the narrative, it feels fair, and while it is expensive to repair armor, it makes sense that it's expensive to repair armor, and by the time you're regularly repairing high-level gear and you're not just repeatedly swapping out different armor sets you get from grunt enemies like you will be in the first 10 to 15 hours of gameplay, you probably have enough money that this isn't that big of an inconvenience. But next we need to talk about some of the more tangential gameplay systems, such as bartering. But before that, a costume change. Okay, I'll see you guys on the other side. Whoosh! Okay. Okay, we're back, let's keep going. Now the next thing I wanna talk about is the bartering system because it's quite simple, but it's yet another example of a gameplay system that's interesting at first, but really poorly executed in the long term. You see, when offered a price for an item you're selling or being told the cost of an item that you wish to acquire, you have the chance to refute the price set forward and challenge the merchant to settle the quarrel in a way that's more advantageous to you. It's a cool idea and one that I'm glad to see, but it's really janky. In simplest terms, what this comes down to is that there's a set price for an item. You will say, I don't like that price, give me a better one. And you'll present an offer that's better for you, at which point the merchant will come back with a price that's better for them, though still slightly less or more than they initially offered. Though they are still making a slight concession based off of the price they offered initially. You'll go back and forth with this until eventually you settle somewhere in the middle. Although it initially seems like it's the case, there isn't actually any careful consideration of any NPC's temperament. There are no mitigating circumstances, and for the most part, this just feels like a guessing game where you try to land in the middle of the initial offers. There really isn't any finesse involved. 
Some NPCs are more disagreeable than others, which basically means that they aren't willing to budge at all. And if you offer too low a price as a counter to their initial offer, they'll grow upset and refuse to sell the item outright. As I've mentioned previously, things such as your physical condition and appearance can have an impact on this agreeableness for the merchants, but it doesn't seem to have any notable impact to the point where I was able to predictably abuse that particular consideration. In other words, like if I'm dealing with a merchant who happens to be involved with the clergy and is a very religious and pious individual, I would think that if I appeared much more poor to them, I would get better prices, whereas if I go and look very poor and run down and I try to negotiate and barter with a wealthy merchant who deals usually with nobility, they would treat me much worse in that case. But unfortunately, that never really happens. It just usually results in a couple of comments being made. And that's about it. Now, even so, I really like this as an idea. I think it could be developed a bit further into something really special, though. Small comments made by the NPC, for example, or facial expressions which suggest that they've had a particularly rough day could all join together to inform the player that this isn't somebody to mess around with. And if they choose to continue engaging, will suffer the consequences and be unable to barter with them at all. In some cases, you could even have the merchant grow so upset with the player for their relentless haggling that they could refuse to sell to them or buy any of their items for an extended period of time, say a couple of in-game days until they've calmed down or perhaps until the player has given them some sort of consolidation gift or changed their appearance entirely. But the problem is, once again, that Kingdom Come Deliverance just isn't this refined. The NPCs have dialogue that I think is meant to communicate their mood, but paired with the bland facial animations and expressions, it's really hard to read. Not to mention that sometimes a merchant who seems particularly grumpy is actually extremely flexible when it comes to the price that they are demanding for an item, and other NPCs who are quite charming act like they are trying to negotiate a settlement between two mega corporations who don't want to admit that they've done anything wrong. I think it's probably a matter of scope. This is a small team that put this game together, and so it's probably unfair of me to demand AAA quality animations, dialogue, and rock star levels of polish. That simply was never going to happen in this game. So I don't want to hold this team to the same standard that I would hold the team behind Red Dead Redemption 2, for example. Rather, I just want to point out that this haggling system has a lot of potential, but it isn't realized. In a sequel, I think this could be refined even further, and paired with the in-game economy, it could lead to some really interesting situations where players who are particularly good at reading the faces, comments, and behavior of merchants could find themselves pursuing bartering as its own playstyle in and of itself to acquire currency, items, and even information. But as it stands in this game, it's simply not there. It's a very simple system and it feels as though it runs its course after just a dozen of encounters or so. Furthermore, there's an ability and skill that you can unlock called Final Offer, and this totally breaks the bartering system entirely. Basically, what it allows you to do is get one final offer after the merchant normally would have just completely backed out of the interaction. And that usually happens when you approach with a really aggressive counter offer or initial offer based on the price put forward. So example, if a sword costs 100 coin and then you come back and say, I only want to pay 50. Normally, the merchant would be so insulted at that offer that they would just simply disengage and walk away. But with the final offer ability, they don't get to walk away. So you'll offer 50, they'll be very pissed off, but you get one last chance. And in return, they will say that's ridiculous and they will come back with their best and final offer, which usually is the lowest possible price that they would be willing to part with that item for. At which point you just slide right up, select that price, and you just got the sword for the cheapest possible price by abusing that one mechanic. I mean, again, we can say that players shouldn't do this, but as we mentioned earlier, if players can break a system, if players can use a mechanic and abuse it, they're going to because the game is holding you to a set standard. And if a tool is available to the player, they're going to use it. And in this case, if you give a skill that's centered around bartering and happens to break the bartering system, I don't think it's the player's fault for using that tool. 
I think it's the developer's fault for not thinking that skill through even just a little bit to polish it to the point where it wouldn't totally break the system. Now, furthermore, I want to discuss navigation because this is what you're going to spend a lot of time doing. There's a lot to talk about here. So let's break it down into the three constituent parts, traversal on foot, traversal on horseback, and generalized exploration. On foot, I think the easiest way to describe the style of exploration in Kingdom Come Deliverance is to say that it suffers from an extreme case of Skyrimitis. This is what I call foot traversal up steep inclines that can be overcome with quick cutbacks and zigzag patterns. You know the type of thing. When you're going up a cliffside in Skyrim, and you really probably shouldn't be able to run up it, but if you zigzag enough, you can kind of spam your way up that hillside and up the rocks and clip up here and jump. It feels cheesy. It's not immersive at all because it looks absolutely ridiculous. And I, I'm not entirely sure what causes it. Maybe it's a limitation of the game's engine not being able to calculate the proper state deepness, if that's a word, of a set level and trying to figure out what the friction level should be for that point. I don't know if it's that or if it's that navigation just happens to be clunky in this game because the developers didn't smooth out some of those steeper ledges and hillsides. But either way, it ends up looking absolutely ridiculous. And being a first person perspective game, there are many times when you'll be working your way up a hillside, staring right at the hill because it's at such a steep incline, but you just keep zigzagging up it to get to where you need to go because it's either you do that or you depart on a detour that will take you all the way around the forest and up around the backside. And I get it. Some people might like going up the backside, but sometimes there just isn't enough time in the day and you just got to go in the front door. You know what I'm saying? Just straight line. Call it there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Was that gag worth it, Luke? I don't think so, but it's too late now. I, I Even if I wanted to get rid of that, the editor is going to keep it in. Jacob wouldn't let me live that down, so it is what it is. Put simply, it just doesn't feel good to play. It looks incredibly stupid, and often it makes the player think that they're going places that they aren't supposed to. Maybe you could pass off this latter point as a feature and not a bug in the system, but I'm not sold on that. I simply don't like going up a hillside and feeling as though I'm gliding up a cliff face that I shouldn't be allowed to go up. Like, Seriously, just lower the incline of this hillside so that it looks less ridiculous or steep it up a little bit further and make it so I can't run up it without sliding back down. I just I don't feel like I'm asking for too much here. Just that the ground behave in a way similar to reality. Granted, some players won't mind this type of thing. This is a pet peeve of mine that's been bugging me for over a decade since Skyrim came out initially. It's been a thing in all Bethesda games for ages now that I think about it. Even in Fallout 3 it was a problem, but there wasn't a lot of outdoor sort of nature exploration in that game. Just ruins, so it wasn't as obvious there. But it's bugged me for a long time, and unfortunately it's here too. Might not bug you, but it bugs me. Maybe it's that the developers think that because Bethesda Game Studios gets away with it, they can too. But I'm done with that excuse. It, it just it looks stupid feels bad, and tears me out of any immersion that I felt in that moment. Now, other elements of on-foot exploration, it's pretty much just comprised of running around, stealthily sneaking around while crouched. Nothing too exciting or magnificent here. I will say there were multiple times where I was actually trying to go someplace that I definitely was supposed to go to, but the game's level designers didn't anticipate how much head clearance there needed to be. So they built levels out with, for example, stairs that didn't have enough clearance above the steps. So as you walked up the stairs, you would hit your head and the character model would become locked in place. Like in this particular quest line where I'm going to this guy to get a gem that I need to retrieve for uh, Lady Stephanie, I believe it, it is, if I'm remembering correctly off the dome here. But this is like, it's just dumb. Like, in order to go up these stairs, I have to crouch and crawl up on all fours, basically. Because there isn't enough clearance. Even though you look at these stairs, there should be clearance. The other characters are able to go up it no problem, but I can't. But without a doubt, the overwhelming majority of exploration time will be spent on your horse. Which you'll acquire roughly probably 10 hours into the game. 
uh, is when you unlock it. And it totally opens up the world because you can not only travel a lot faster, but it also makes fast travel very applicable and justifiable. You see how fast travel works in this game is actually really interesting and I really like it. Basically, nothing is for free so you will open up your map and choose the location that you want to fast travel to so long as you're not actively engaged in combat you know the normal stuff you select the location you want to go to but you will realize that there's a set amount of time it will take you to travel to that location you don't just instantly appear there. Furthermore, because it actually takes in-game time to travel, regardless of whether you are doing it yourself on foot or on horseback or using the fast travel system, all of your stats will deplete in real time. So your amount of energy will deplete, your hunger will deplete, and if you have bleeding wounds and other injuries that could possibly affect your overall health, that could also decline over time. It's really cool because it makes it so every time you want to make a big trip on horseback across the map, you have to basically plan it out. Make sure you have enough food, make sure you've rested up, because if you don't, you could end up getting in a really rough spot. In addition, there are also chances of encounters while you travel again whether it's on foot horseback or through the fast travel system so if you're simply riding your horse across a field there is a set percentage chance that you encounter thieves bandits it could be somebody asking for help it could be a body laying there that you need to investigate and every time that happens you are given the opportunity to stop or to continue along your way with a set percentage chance likelihood that you'll be successful in either which way. And these encounters are actually very practical and pragmatic based off of your current positioning in the game's world. So if you are fast traveling at night on foot, the odds of you being jumped by bandits, especially while going through heavily wooded areas, spikes dramatically. You can almost guarantee that you will get jumped and attacked, which early in the game is basically a death sentence. Compare that to riding through open fields, it's not as big of a risk because those bandits don't want to hang out in areas where they could be easily seen. Makes sense. Furthermore, on really narrow roads, it's really difficult for you to escape and avoid those encounters when they appear. So chances are if you get jumped, you're not getting out of it. It makes the horse seem so unbelievably useful once you finally get access to it after, again, about 10 hours or so in game. It, it's just a total game changer because all of a sudden the world opens up, not just because you can ride between locations quickly, but because now fast travel is actually practical. You can trust that your horse will get you from point A to point B quickly and reliably, and even if you are jumped, your odds of escaping quickly without dealing with bandits or any sort of surprise ambush go up dramatically. So it's much more reasonable to fast travel and to go to a lot more places in a lot shorter time. Now speaking of those horses specifically, there are some interesting elements to their design. You see, horses have an assortment of stats that affect their speed, carrying capacity, and even controllability. Speed is self-explanatory. Carrying capacity basically just means that you can move items from your inventory onto the horse into the saddlebag so that you can still move around and fast travel while carrying a lot of stuff. And then, of course, controllability is just ease of control, how responsive they are to your commands. It's another reason why horses totally change the game once you get access to them, because the carrying capacity alone makes hunting practical. Prior to that, you would go out, you could hunt a deer, but a quarter of the meat would be so heavy that you couldn't reasonably expect to carry any more than that quarter of the total meat produced back to the poacher or the butcher, whoever you happen to be selling the meat to. Whereas once you get the horse, the increased carrying capacity makes it so you can justify going out, killing a few rabbits and a couple deer, taking all of that meat back at once and selling it all together at the same time. It makes it very, very practical. Which again, I love. It makes sense in the world and it's practical because Henry himself would want to be able to go out hunting, but he's not going to be able to throw two deer over each shoulder and carry them miles to the closest town or village. So once he gets a horse, of course he's able to carry more meat. 
it only makes sense and it makes that particular gameplay addition feel truly useful and it's something that a lot of players who are starting the game will sprint towards because it greatly improves the overall gameplay experience once you're able to engage in all of these systems equally. Now after spending a lot of time testing and trying to pay close attention to these different stats, I can confidently say that I can't really tell the difference between one horse that's supposedly better than another. At times it felt as though I was noticing a speed difference, that one horse had more stamina than another, but it was never anything conclusive and certainly not something that would drive me to go out and spend my time and more Groshen collecting a better horse. It just didn't feel worth it. But even if you could tell the difference between one horse that's statistically better than another horse, there are very few avenues for you to go through to actually acquire that better horse. They're all going to be legit because the game doesn't actually have robust systems in place to allow you to steal horses. You can go out, find a good horse and take it for yourself, but you can't actually assign it to yourself. You can't go and try to sell it to a mill. Like you can't do anything with it. You're just going to use it until you hit a story cutscene or some sort of quest that causes it to despawn and then it's gone forever and you're just dealing with the consequences of having stolen a horse. You can't make them your own, you can't offload them through the millers, and this means that there's very little reason to steal horses outside of narrative beats, especially since you're going to receive a horse fairly early in the game that can be summoned at any time. And because you can't really tell the difference between the two horses, there's not much of an incentive to go and steal a better one even over the short term. Unfortunately, as it stands, the mechanic of stealing horses, which is something they set up pretty clearly early in the game, basically has no use in the core gameplay loop. The only time it makes sense to steal a horse is when the story forces you to do it because the other systems that only make sense for a mechanic like this aren't set up to handle it. Now, narratively speaking, this probably makes sense. Rumors would certainly begin to swirl if a ton of stolen horses began flooding local stables. Pretty soon, no doubt, local authorities would start to notice that you were the one constantly bringing them in, and in no time, you would probably be questioned and thrown in jail or slapped with a huge fine or just outright executed. So I can absolutely understand why the developers might feel as though rewarding the player for horse theft would be more trouble than it's worth. However, I would counter by saying that there are many mechanics in this game that punish the player for engaging in. Even something as simple as eating can have major negative status effects if it's done too much. Just because the local authorities would likely have questions for you, or even find out, doesn't mean that it should be withheld from the player as an option. It's not to say that every stable hand should be willing to pay top dollar for a stolen horse in the game, but it is to say that it would be nice if those characters even considered the option. You could go to a stable hand and offer a horse for sale that you had recently stolen. You could even ask for a lower price so long as they took the horse off of your hands with no questions asked. They could even interrogate you, asking where you stole the horse from or where it should be looked for if authorities were to search for it, in which case the horses stolen from farther away from the stable you're currently at would be worth a lot more than the horses stolen from nearby because those are ones that are going to obviously garner more suspicion. So all of a sudden you're incentivized to actively participate in this criminal enterprise of riding to the outskirts of the map, stealing horses there, riding them all the way across the map and selling them as far as they could possibly be away from the original location. That would be a gameplay loop in and of itself that could be justifiable. And even then they could still turn you down because it's not worth the risk, potentially even tipping off local authorities that there's a sketchy guy trying to sell what seems to be a stolen horse. That would effectively solve the problem in my mind. It would make it an option for players, but it would make it one that's so risky it's effectively stupid to engage with it. Because after all, a major element of freedom in video games is giving players the ability to do things that are smart and the ability to do things that are stupid and detrimental to their own goals. It's one of the reasons that people love RPGs so much, because it allows you to live out whatever crazy fantasy you might want to, even if it's objectively insane and could result in a much shorter 
overall time with the game. But you know what? It's not that big of a deal. Sure, you can't steal horses and then sell them and treat that as its own criminal enterprise, even though certain story beats will treat it as though it is a valid enterprise. It's not that big of a deal, but it's little things like this that start to add up when you start to notice that there's a lot of really good ideas in Kingdom Come Deliverance, but a lot of them are just surface level. They're not actually thought through and borne out throughout the entire game world, which is hopefully what we see happen in a sequel. Now, as for general exploration of the game's world, this mostly settles on world design itself trying to create a map that's actually worth exploring for its own sake. And this is something I think the game actually struggles with a fair amount, because while I do think there are some really beautiful sections in the game, there aren't enough major set pieces to make it feel as though you could stumble onto one at any moment while exploring forests and ravines. The closest they get to is having these little accident sites on roadsides, and if you happen to stop at one, you can find interesting items, notes, or perhaps even a body or two laying nearby. There's nothing too complex here, it's just a fun little set piece that's meant to give more context to the world and perhaps even tie into a local side quest. There are mine shafts, bandit encampments, entire cities to be found, and all of that is worth exploring for its own sake. But in terms of generalized exploration through the main open world, usually you're just going to be running along trails and through large open grass fields or thick, dense forests. Other than the cities and castles, Nothing here really feels hand-placed or hand-designed. It all just feels very, very procedural. I don't know how else to put it. The forests are very, very dense, but are generally flat and not that interesting. Like, there's trees everywhere, and some of them might have locations contained within that feature deer, boar hunting sites and the like, which are worth exploring and finding out because that's a great way to make money. But exploring that forest after you initially discover it isn't really worth doing. You know, what makes me really appreciate the design work from Bethesda Game Studios. They are the masters of open world design, specifically making a large map so densely packed with content that it's enjoyable to explore even dozens or hundreds of hours after you first step foot into that map. It's something they're very, very good at. And Kingdom Come Deliverance just doesn't really meet that standard. It's just not there. There's too much emptiness. There aren't enough interesting things to stop and grab your attention. And as a result, it feels largely empty. And sure, they can get away with this a lot better than a game like Fallout 4 or even Skyrim because this is supposed to be more realistic and grounded. But at the same time, I can say that just because it's supposed to be realistic doesn't mean that they can get away with making an uninteresting open world or a world that's not fun to explore for its own sake. It may be realistic, but it's still a video game at the end of the day, and it needs to hold to the same expectations and standards that have been established for every other major open world game for the last 20 years. Now, one of the ways that the game will regularly try to push you into situations where you have a reason to explore the open world are with fetch quests. Earlier, I mentioned the example of the starter quest after the prologue, where you will be tasked with going to a grave, digging up the body, and retrieving a ring that's on his hand. That's an example of a fetch quest. And later in the game, they keep doing this over and over and over again. Even in one quest line, you could have multiple items that you have to go out and fetch just because the person wants you to go get them. They could have other servants, other people at their command that would be much more reasonable mules, but they still ask you for some reason. Such as this example, where you need to help out Lady Stephanie acquire some items for a wedding. She needs you to fetch the wine, the roan, which is just a horse, and a crown, which was supposed to be delivered weeks ago, but is far behind schedule. You basically have to hunt these items down and bring them back. She could have hired other people to do it. She has an entire army at her disposal, basically. She could have asked any of them or even three of them to go fetch these items all at the same time. But instead, you are tasked with doing it for some reason. I mean, later we find out that perhaps she has a bit of a crush on you. And maybe that's why she's asking you to help to, I guess, 
get closer to you, but that seems like a bit of a stretch. But even so, you just have to go out to the rough locations where these are hidden at and find them. The wine you have to basically play for during an archery tournament, the horse you have to go grab and then ride all the way back to the stable. And while you're riding it, you have to sing it a song. Otherwise, it rears and kicks you off. I will say this was one of the funnier moments in any side quest that I encountered. It was kind of funny. You've got to sing to the horse the whole time you ride it. and It's just funny. And then going and fetching the crown, which isn't particularly dramatic. You just go speak to this guy, say, hey, I need this thing. He's like, oh, well, the rock never showed up. You got to go find it. So you go find the rock, then you bring it back. And then he's like, give me a couple days and I'll fix it. And then you give him a couple days just by going outside and then sitting on a chair and passing time for two in-game days. And then you come back up, he gives it to you and you run it back to Lady Stephanie. Not that exciting. I mean, again, I want to be more sympathetic than not with these things because it's just, it's hard to design side quests for a game period, much less for an open world game that's trying to be relatively grounded in reality and somewhat realistic. So I can appreciate that they probably were like, I don't know, we'll just have them ride around and get stuff. I don't know what else we need to do, especially because the combat isn't that engaging to begin with. So they effectively just have this over-reliance on fetch quests because they probably realized pretty early on that sending people out to go and take on bandit camps and things wasn't that fun because the combat sucked so they relied on this it's not great but i guess it's the better of the two options but as we learned with the witcher 3 there are some really fun ways that you can create more content even outside of the core gameplay loop that you would be engaging with throughout the main story whether it's combat or bartering or any number of other things such as acting in plays that different characters are putting on or trying to negotiate a deal between two parties or needing to do research on local wildlife and fauna or perhaps experimenting with different crafting and alchemy abilities to find an item that's going to be of use to a given character all of that stuff could be really fun challenging and unique to this world while being better than a fetch quest. Now, actually a really great example of a moment in this game that pulls off side content and secondary objectives really, really well is the Woman's Lot DLC, which is actually pretty polarizing. A lot of people loved it, a lot of people hated it, but I actually thought it was pretty good. In this DLC, you will play as Teresa. It lets you explore the starting area from her point of view, which is as mundane as you would expect, and yet it's oddly charming. You perform various menial tasks, such as feeding the chickens, weeding the garden, feeding the dog, and going into town to run some errands for your father. And while I certainly wouldn't want to play a 20-hour game that's nothing but this, getting the opportunity to live the simple life is actually fairly refreshing, especially because the opening dozen or so hours of Kingdom Come Deliverance are pretty exhausting, both emotionally and in terms of the taxing gameplay. A lot happens and the game demands a lot from the player. Getting the opportunity to just slow down and smell the roses, almost literally, is a really nice addition. And so while I enjoy it, I really didn't expect to see something like this here. Just because I enjoy it doesn't mean that I think it was a safe bet on the part of the developers. You see, it adds a lot narratively to Teresa as a character, but when developing ideas for DLC, I could certainly see how something like this could be cut without much thought. After all, it's kind of hard to justify spending time developing an entire sequence where you are literally playing as a farmhand when the rest of the game is about combat and role playing. But that latter element is the exact reason why this works so well, in my opinion. Exploring the world through somebody else's eyes helps you gain a greater understanding of said world, and it works really well to expose the player to all new perspectives. And this isn't the first time that this has been done, or even the most recent time that it's been implemented in a game. Red Dead Redemption 2, for example, uses the epilogue sequence to change the rhythm and pace of gameplay significantly to reset player expectations, emotions, and to give them a new outlook on the world that's been created. In that epilogue, you will literally spend hours upon hours working as a farmhand or building up your own farmstead after an extended ending sequence for the base game that includes some of the most elaborate combat sequences that Rockstar has ever designed. It's about as much of a 180 as you could possibly pull, and yet it works fantastically well. 
And the reason it works so well is because it resets the player's perspective so that they are once again vulnerable to the emotional manipulation that's involved in most storytelling. If all you do in Kingdom Come Deliverance is run around hacking and slashing, you shouldn't be surprised when the player grows disconnected from the NPCs and from their stories of their troubles, however small they may be. But if you take these moments to reset the perspective and help the player understand that there is more to this world than just their own escapades, you can craft a more captivating and engaging world on the whole. But that being said, I don't think these sequences are perfect, and I think this DLC does have its problems. Now, when we're bringing up the idea of pacing in a game, I think that we can point to these sequences in this DLC as the most egregious offenders. Even though I think they serve a narrative purpose, I think it's not refined or polished enough to really maximize the actual benefit. I really appreciate the narrative reason that this DLC is here, but the activities you'll be engaging in are just as, if not more, mundane than the worst side content in the main campaign. It shakes up pace, certainly, which is a very good thing, and it also tasks the player with completing various tasks that you probably won't be completing in the base game. However, it dwells on this for far too long. It's like when I was shopping for a car, like a year and a half ago. I was looking for something that was going to be a nice commuter car that I could take on the highway because I had to commute to Denver from where I lived at the time every single morning, which was like an hour and 15 minute drive. So every morning and every evening, I was driving an hour and 15 minutes there, hour 15 minutes back just to go to work Monday through Friday. Exhausting. Don't recommend it, especially if, if you have to be at work at 8 a.m. But setting that aside, I was shopping for a car. I went into the dealership. A couple of the, the dealerships I went to were terrible, but one I found had a very bored and very passionate salesman, and he made a point of trying to contrast the different options before me, the different things that I could enjoy, almost like gameplay elements in a video game. Some really good cars, some really awful cars. So what he did is he would take me in a total piece of garbage. And we would drive around the lot and he'd be like, so you feel this bump, you feel that when you crank the wheel, you feel that when you try to press this button, you hear that grinding sound as the like the sunroof opens. That's all terrible. Now, let me take you over to our really nice car. You'll appreciate that. So the pace of that sales experience is up in balance and it's in throws and he's trying to get it to feel just right so that I'm compelled to go with the nicer car out of the two options. And then after we get done with the nice car, he takes me over and we try the crappy car again. And then he takes me back over. We try another nice car. And then he shows me another crappy car. And he's pitching this as I'm giving you options and you're seeing this and you're seeing all of the options, the good and the bad, so you can make an informed decision. But what he's actually doing is just trying to push me into the nice stuff by making me really hate the crappy stuff. And in this case, like with Kingdom Come Deliverance, that's all good and dandy. I can appreciate being shown the crappy stuff in comparison to the good stuff so that I can appreciate when it's done well and I can appreciate when it's done badly because it shakes up the pace and it makes me sort of reset my expectations for gameplay. But when you focus on the crappy car too much, I'm just left wondering what the hell I'm doing here. I'm taking an entire afternoon to try out nice cars and you're driving me around in like a 2006 Honda Civic. I don't mean to insult you if that happens to be the car that you drive. I think the one that we were operating had severe body damage and probably like a bent frame probably wasn't legal to drive. But even so, if you focus on the bad stuff too much, even if there's a tactical reason you're doing it, sometimes you end up just losing the audience in the process. That was a really complicated way of just saying, I think they have too much like gardening in this DLC and not enough fighting and com like different stuff. I think they have too much gardening. That that's basically what I'm saying. <laughs> Throughout the opening couple of hours of the DLC, which is around five hours in total, all you'll be doing is speaking to NPCs, working through predetermined dialogue trees that don't actually have any real variability or branching options. You'll be speaking to people to find out what they need you to fetch for them, going out and fetching said items for yourself and engaging in extremely repetitious activities, such as the aforementioned weed pulling. And again, 
I understand that this isn't necessarily supposed to be fun. You are just being put into the position of somebody who works manual jobs and whose life isn't that exciting so that when they contrast it later with what her life becomes, you appreciate where she ended up. I can understand that, but it doesn't change the fact that for a video game, it's still bland and boring. Again, just because there's a tactical narrative reason for doing something doesn't mean that you are free from all of the basic requirements of a video game, which is that it's engaging and not tediously boring. Such as in Death Stranding, I get it, you're shipping boxes between two locations, and because the nation has fallen, there's no infrastructure in place like roads or zip lines or anything like that, so you're going to be walking and running most of the way. It's narratively justified, but it's still just walking, and that's like, that's the whole game. <laughs> It can make sense, but that doesn't mean that it's a good game, you know? Like, we could make a video game that's just IRS Tax Auditor Simulator 2022, and all you do is audit randomly generated tax returns. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. We could even set up a system where, like, if you don't do a good enough job, then you get fired and then your wife divorces you and all of your children are taken from you as you are admitted into an insane asylum. It could be all justified, narratively speaking. But is that a fun game? Is that a good game? Probably not. Though I'll be real, I would, I would probably play it. It sounds kind of fun to me. All of this to say, while I can appreciate what this DLC was trying to do, and while I think it does shake up the monotony of the base gameplay loop, I don't think it gets the pacing quite right in a way where it makes you really appreciate the things that it brings to the table while also appreciating the things that the base game had. Instead, it just feels like a five hour detour where all you do is like walk around fetching things and living a boring life as a farmhand and, and like that's it. It's, it's like, that's it. <laughs> It's a great narrative DLC. If you want to learn more about this world and more about Teresa and see everything that happened in the opening hours of the game from a different perspective, absolutely give it a shot. It's it's actually pretty good in that regard. But in terms of gameplay, it, it's not tremendous. It shakes it up, which is good. But then it just focuses on all the wrong elements of the shakeup for far too long. Now, lastly, let's touch on a couple of random things that I think need to be addressed. For one, there's some weird eccentricities in the game that are probably a result of technical restrictions or just oversights on the part of the developers. For example, fines for committing crimes. That sort of rhymed, but not, not really. Anyway, you commit a crime such as beating somebody up, trying to steal something, and a guard will chase you down if you are seen doing this or it's been reported and they can tie you to it somehow. A guard will come up to you and demand recompense. You have to pay a set fine or you're going to have the item taken back, go to jail, possibly die and reset fully. Later on in the game, depending on what your stats are, you can sometimes intimidate the guards to basically leave you alone, which is basically just at that point a free pass to steal and do whatever you want, which is really fun. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it kind of totally breaks the game, but it, it's certainly fun. But even after 30 to 40 hours in the game, I had so much gold and groschen in my inventory that the fines they were levying against me were basically of no consequence. Like I would have 5,000 groschen and then they would fine me 30 for something I did randomly for like breaking in and stealing some item that was really worthwhile. And so I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll pay your fine, whatever. I already sold the item, so I'm not going to give it back to you. I'm totally good. Take your fine, whatever. I don't care. It, it never felt as though the punishment for the crime was enough to keep me from committing it. I mean, going back to what we discussed previously, maybe these rules and fines are only set in place for the opening hours of the game to get players to play on the straight and narrow while those fines really have a negative impact on them. But that doesn't really seem to be the case just because it ends up being so totally out of balance during the mid and late game that it just doesn't make sense to avoid committing crimes at all. Like you can just go out, be a crazy bandit, do whatever you want, and they'll fine you a little bit here and there. It's not a big deal. For some serious crimes, yes, the guards will just attack you and they'll try to kill you. And if you don't get away, you're probably gonna die because like I said, fighting multiple guards at the same time 
is an absolute nightmare. Even if you're experienced and know what you're doing in the combat, it still just kind of sucks and is clunky and sometimes you die through no fault of your own just because the camera kept swapping back between different characters and you couldn't figure out what the hell was going on. Something simple like a percentage based fine could have worked really really well. In other words if you have a thousand Groshen in your inventory you commit some crime that's particularly egregious that's in this tier that's a 10% fine on whatever your net worth is so you have to pay out a hundred Groshen in that case. That would be much more effective I think than just an arbitrary number that gets generated somehow that I can't seem to figure out. This is coming from the wiki and based on their research, which actually lines up with everything that I've seen as well, it looks as though the fines are just arbitrary amounts that have been set in place by the developers and they don't change based on where you are in the game or what motivated or was tied to the particular activity that was a crime. So in the case of this, like stealing, looting, unconscious or dead non-bandit bodies results in a fine of 60 groschen. Doesn't matter what you stole, doesn't matter how valuable it was, doesn't matter the social status of the particular individual you stole from, if they were a lowly gent or if they were very wealthy, it doesn't matter. Lockpicking, same thing, 300 groschen, 10 days in jail if you can't pay it, which does suck, but again like 40 50 hours in the game that's really not that much reckless riding which is a particularly infuriating one because the horses tend to control like ass in cities uh because there's so many buildings and things that are in the way that you have to kind of navigate your way through so in order to actually avoid a person you usually end up just ramming into another so like this is a really frustrating one because I've definitely been slapped with that one a lot. Um, killing somebody, that one results, there, there's no fine. You just go straight to jail, right away. Straight to jail, straight to jail. You undercook fish, believe it or not, jail. You overcook chicken, also jail. Now, like I said, if you can't pay these fines, you do have the option to basically go to jail to pay your fine in effect. And the guards are going to take the object that you stole or... If you got any sort of profit from your criminal activity, they will take that away from you uh, regardless. So crime doesn't usually pay, but even when crime does pay, the punishment for the crime is so minimal that there really isn't much reason to avoid crime in the first place, you know? So it's just like, what's the point? Like I get it. You want to leave the door open for players to be able to commit crimes without having an hour of gameplay time totally ruined i can appreciate that and understand that but i do think if you're going to try to have a realistic world with authority figures that the player needs to respect you have to take steps to make the punishments fit the crime in the case of murder usually guards will just chase you down and beat you to death and that kind of makes sense they caught you murdering somebody you should probably die for that they're not going to be very understanding about it but for a lot of these other crimes it's just going to result in you paying a little fine and going about your business if there were much steeper fines or fines that directly related to your level or like it works in other games such as skyrim and and for example a lot of mods that were released for fallout new vegas where the fine would actually adjust to your overall player level and if you couldn't pay it you had to forfeit items in your inventory to reach that level of payout to pay your fine just like if you owe money to the irs you know they're going to come and seize items to basically make up that difference that would make sense that i think would make crime while potentially profitable a really questionable activity and you would really have to think pretty clearly as to whether or not you wanted to engage in it. I think one of the reasons the developers felt as though they didn't need to worry about that was because they do have a system in place where if you are caught repeatedly committing crimes in one area over and over and over again, people will grow to distrust you. And even if you go to jail, you do get a, a debuff that's called the released prisoner debuff which basically just causes you to lose strength, agility, and vitality for a set period of time. And as a result, people, when you try to barter with them, will look at you with a lot of skepticism and you know, skeptical hippo eyes. They won't want to work with you, and for good reason. You're a criminal. Makes sense. But I think the temporary threat of a debuff just is not enough to truly affect a player's actions. Because I know from my own experience, I am much more likely 
to go if I receive this debuff and just hang out in the woods hunting for a set period of time until that debuff wears off. And then once it wears off, I'll come back into town and everything will be right as rain. No problem. You know, in games like Red Dead Redemption 2, I'm sorry, I keep bringing it up. It's just so tremendously fantastic. We have situations where bounties are levied against you, and usually those bounties are pretty steep and very expensive. And if you're seen in that area where the bounty is currently placed, you're going to be attacked on site. It's not going to go well for you. And so it actually affects your gameplay experience pretty severely. So you can go commit crimes and murder people, be a terrible person, but it's going to have a very negative effect on your experience in the game moving forward. And that action has an equal and opposite reaction. And the last thing I want to touch on are just the skills in general. As I've mentioned throughout the course of this video, there are a handful of skills that while interesting initially, end up just totally breaking the system that they are tied to. The best example being that final offer skill, which just totally breaks the bartering system to the point where there's no reason to really engage with any other skills with regards to monetary uh, negotiation because you just broke it. Like you're going to pretty much every single time get the best possible price by just initially offering the lowest possible price. They'll come down, you get another option, and then you meet them there. That's all it is. And so while it's a skill that the developers put in place as a reward for experience in the game, it just ends up breaking the system that it's supposed to basically further your engagement in. And it doesn't make any sense. It's like giving a, a skill for hand-to-hand -hand combat, which makes you one punch man, where every single punch is an instant kill. It's like, okay, well, I mean, it's it's a strong ability, but it kind of broke the whole thing. Like, I don't, I don't know why you put that there. That's kind of dumb. There's also another skill that you can acquire called Dreadful, which is aimed towards addressing an issue that I've brought up many, many times over the course of this video, and that is multiple enemies in a single encounter. Basically, it makes you dreadful. So enemies look at you and feel dread, and it greatly increases the odds that enemies will flee during combat leaving you to only fight one or maybe two when initially there were four or five. And I thought this was just me, but it's not. I looked it up and it's apparently still a major issue. This skill is just like totally broken. Uh, when you have it equipped and you've, you've earned it and put it on Henry, enemies will just regularly like not spawn <laughs> like at all. They just won't show up. So you'll have entire combat encounters that are scripted for the main story and the enemies will just never show up. You're just like standing around the combat musical start up and like you're ready to go. And Henry's even delivering dialogue like, come here. I've got you. <laughs> but no enemies. It's really, really dumb. It also seems like a really weird patch fix for an issue. Like imagine any other game. Hey, we have this this racing game that we're making and there's an issue where this particular class of cars, they have this problem where if they drive over water, the car thinks that it's falling through the ground and it's it's just disappearing. So instead of actually lowering traction and you drift, the car just despawns out of the map and everybody has to reset. It's a major glitch. It's a big problem. Um, not fun at all. And then the developers are like, I know the solution. We'll add in an ability that the driver can unlock, which removes all of the water puddles in all of the levels. No more bug, no more issue. It's like, well, I mean, I, I guess it fixes it. But like, I guess, but that's like if you have a splinter in your hand and then you just cut off your hand at the wrist. It's like, yeah, I guess you don't have a splinter anymore, but you kind of like just totally destroyed <laughs> the whole thing that you were trying to protect and save. Like, it just doesn't make any damn sense at all. And there's a lot of systems like this at play in a game like Kingdom Come Deliverance. And to wrap all of this up, I think in general, Kingdom Come Deliverance is a really great game. I know we've been bashing on it for the last little bit, but that's because there's a lot of jank to bash on. 
As I said at the beginning, I think this game is something special and I think it's one of the most immersive games that I've played in recent memory. I really do. But there are a lot of issues and pretending that the issues don't exist doesn't do us, the players, or the developers any favors at all. They need to hear this stuff called out so that they can address it and fix it for the sequel. In many ways, a lot of these problems are actually sort of a compliment to the developers because if I had just problems with how the game was generally set up and how the gameplay loop was established and the premise of the game entirely, going back to the example of like IRS audit simulator, uh, if I had problems like that, this would be a very different video. But this video is more generally meant to discuss the things that I think are very fixable and very addressable in a sequel. And most of these problems, I think, came out of the game slowly being developed and slowly realizing what it wanted to be and what it was going to be in the end. And as a result, there are some ideas that were introduced later in development and other ideas that were introduced pretty early on. And as a result, there's just some friction and some things aren't as fleshed out as they should be and et cetera, et cetera. I think with a sequel, they could very easily get all of this stuff laid out clearly on the table ahead of time. And then they could step forward into the development of the sequel, knowing exactly what they want to do and how they want it to work. They have the vision clearly in front of them. We're going to do what we did in the first game, but just really, really well. That is the game I want. This but polished and refined like hell. But as always, there's mitigating circumstances, complexities you never really know. And who knows, maybe they've been so quiet up until now about what they're working on next because they aren't actually working on a sequel to Kingdom Come and they're working on something totally different. Who knows? We can only assume it's something more in the line of Kingdom Come Deliverance, but we'll just have to wait and see. What I do know is whatever it is, I am keenly interested and eagerly anticipating. Let me know your thoughts on Kingdom Come Deliverance as well in the comment section below the like button. I'd love to hear what you have to think. Come over and join me on Twitch. You've seen a bunch of Twitch gameplay over the course of the video that was all recorded live with you guys. Some of you guys that were there in chat when it was happening. So if you want to be one of those lucky people to hang out and get in a video, hop over, say hi. And of course, follow all of my social media links in the link tree. Again, in the description box. Like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to get notified of when the Horizon Forbidden West and Elden Ring critiques go live. Those are my next big project right after this, so those are quickly on their way. But with that, I love you all very, very much, more than you could possibly know, and I'll see you in the next video. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye.